The Christadelphians present This is Your Bible, a program dedicated to the study of your Bible to learn about the wonderful future that God has planned for this earth. Join us now as we open up the Bible and reason together around God's Word. Hello, I'm your host, Christian Russell, and on behalf of the Christadelphians, I'd like to welcome you to This is Your Bible. Your Bible is like my Bible. It covers a long period of time and includes the names and examples and lessons of many, many people. Some people were faithful, some were wicked, some succumbed to temptation and weakness, while others, through great faith, overcame great obstacles. The Bible is constantly directing our attention to the things that God approves of and the things that He does not approve of. The book of Esther is in the Old Testament and it contains this very comparison. Although it's one of the shortest books in the Old Testament, and it covers a period of history that's thousands of years ago, it's still relevant to us today. So don't go away. When we come back, we're going to be looking at the book of Esther in more detail. I don't know what your idea of paradise is. We all have our own views on the subject, but I think that most would agree the scenes we are looking at could be described as a touch of paradise. The Creator made this earth a paradise originally, and then mankind spoiled it by trying to do things his own self-centered way. Mankind has ever since tried to create his own paradise, one in which man is glorified and the Creator is forgotten. All around us we can see grim reminders of the remoteness of paradise, reminders that man without God cannot bridge that distance to the true paradise. In the Bible, in the book of Genesis, we're told that the original creation made by God was very good. We are also told that throughout the Bible that the world will be very good again when Jesus Christ returns to establish the kingdom of God on the earth. In Psalm 72 it says, He, Christ, shall deliver the needy when he cries, the poor also and him that has no helper. He will redeem their life from oppression and violence. In Isaiah 35, the desert shall rejoice and blossom as a rose. Then the eyes of the blind shall be open, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like a deer, and the tongue of the dumb sing. And in the book of Revelation there shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain. Sounds good, doesn't it? This is what the Bible has to say about the good things to come. You can learn more about the message of the Bible and your part in God's plan by signing up for our free online Bible courses at thisisyourbible.com. Just click on the Learn More tab and register for Exploring the Bible. Yes, the Bible does tell us that there will be a true paradise here, again, on earth, soon. Will you be ready? Welcome back. Joining me in the studio is a Bible student, Ron Stewart. Ron is from Central California. Ron, thank you for joining us. Yes. Um, now, we're going to look at the book of Esther, and we're going to look at some... Uh, obviously, we don't have a lot of time to look at everything in Esther, but we're going to try and zero in on a couple of different themes. Mm -hmm. I knew we were going to talk about Esther, so I read it uh, just prior to this program again, and, and it struck me that there is nowhere mentioned in the book of Esther the name of God. Is, can you make a comment about that? That's true, Christian. Uh, the name of God is not mentioned in this book. That's why some Bible critics feel it actually should not be in Scripture. But if you f take the time to read through the book, you will discover that God's hand is in it everywhere, leading his people in a direction that he wants them to go. You know, clear back in uh, Deuteronomy, God said that if his people left him, he would hide his face from them. And some Bible students feel that in the book of Esther, he has hidden his face. Although in an acrostic form, the Jews, many Jewish scholars, feel they have found his name. Now acrostic, by that I mean by going to the original Hebrew and looking at different sequences or t uh, gaps in the, the language, they have found the name Yahweh four times and Iyah once. So they feel that, they, they feel that the name of, of God is subtly buried in there, but, but you're saying that from a, a, a sort of standing back and looking at it from that perspective, 
you can see that God is there arranging the details? Yes, we, we like to call it providence, divine providence. That, that's setting in order a whole lot of little incidental things that lead to a conclusion where God wants it. It's a divine design. Now, in this book, there, can you just hit on a couple of examples of that? Well, there's a couple of things that come to mind right away. Uh, first of all, Esther. She does not start out being the queen in this book. It's Vashti, who we'll get to in just a few minutes. But Esther starts out here as a poor little Hebrew girl. Uh, she is elevated to a height of queen in the land through a series of different events, which uh, to, to all practical purposes just wouldn't happen if it hadn't been for d divine design. So it's completely, it completely unusual for her to end up in that position. That's correct. Any other, any other examples of, of, of God placing or arranging the details? Well, one, uh, another one would be Mordecai, who is her uncle. Okay. Uh, when uh, Esther was just a young girl, uh, by the way, Esther is not her Hebrew name. It's Hadash. Uh, Esther, who we know her by, is her Persian name. Okay. But when Mordecai, or when Esther was just a young girl, her parents passed away. And so Mordecai stepped in and he raised her. And it just happened to be at this time in history, which most Bible scholars feel was from about 454 to 486 BC, or 486 to 454, um, he was in a position at the king's gate. He had been elevated to a very honorable position. And if he hadn't have been in that position, this whole story couldn't have taken place, so it unfolds. So really the, the providence, as, you, as you're describing it, the providence there, God arranging the details, is setting up the, the right people in the right place at the right time. That's exactly right. Okay, that, so, that's so, a principle that's always been and got with God. And so we can see in the book of Esther this, this arrangement, this, this care that God has arranging these small details which otherwise would have, been, would, would have been difficult, would have almost been impossible. That's right. From a human uh, point of view, it would have been impossible. It seems that there, when I was reading it, it seemed that there was a, also a link or an echo, if you like, looking for similar stories uh, in, in Scripture, in the Bible, uh, to another set of, uh, another story where there was also this sort of, this uh, almost um, impossible set of arrangement, uh, this arrangement of details, this impossible set of circumstances, seems to be an echo with the book of Ruth. That's right. It's a very interesting echo because when you compare the book of Ruth and the book of Esther, the only two books in the Bible that bear a woman's name, in, in the book of Ruth, you have a, uh, a, a non-Jewish person married to a Jew. In the okay. book of Esther, you have a Jewish girl married to a non-Jew. Uh, in the book of Ruth, you have somebody in absolute poverty. Uh, when you come over to the book of Esther, you have a person in the luxurious court of the king. The queen, right? Or the queen, yeah. And, and then when you come over to the book of Ruth, uh, you've got... Uh, individual salvation over at the book of Esther it's national salvation so there's a wonderful comparison there so there's a comparison it's not exactly the same comparison it's almost as if God is saying through 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 scripture whether you look at this from being a Jew or a non-Jew whether you look at it from being a position of poverty or wealth or whether you're looking at it in terms of individual salvation versus national salvation I've got the answer for you. I've got the lesson for you. That's right. Okay. God, God is always there. He's, he's behind the scenes. And so we can take a sort of a, a, an echo or a parallel then with Ruth, both, both faithful, courageous women. That's right. That's and right. Uh, obviously this, this, lesson, this lesson then comes through of God's providence. And also in the book of Ruth, we see God's hand, just as we do in Esther, guiding the affairs all right. the way through. Right. Um, the, uh, the book of Esther it strikes me. A lot of people always think that the Bible is completely relevant today, especially the Old Testament. Yeah. And when we're talking about something that happened 500 years B.C., we're talking about something that essentially happened, what, 2,500 years ago? Correct. Yeah. Um, how is that possibly relevant today? But I do know that today they celebrate this, this story of Esther. Right. Uh, in fact, Mordecai, who we'll talk about a little more later, set up this feast of Purim, they call it, and that's celebrated today. It's celebrated between the new moon of, a of February and the new moon of March. So the and Jews today celebrate Purim as a feast which remembers... That remembers their deliverance from Haman, who was the Jew hater, which we're going to look in more detail. Okay, so the story is about, includes... Uh, the, the salvation of the Jewish people from somebody who hated the Jews and that's what they celebrate today? That's correct. That's okay. correct. They, they celebrate God's deliverance. 
So they still celebrate it, so it's still relevant. The lesson is still obviously relevant to us. We, we want to try and uh, draw out a, just a, a lesson or two from, from it. Yeah, there's uh, several lessons here to be learned. Okay, well, let's, very relevant. let's start then probably by looking at the characters. Can, yeah. can you outline the, the three of the four main uh, protagonists well, I, to actually, the story? Actually, uh, Christian, there's five main characters in this book. There's Ahasuerus, who is the Persian king, the monarch. Okay. And then we've got Vashti, who was the deposed queen. And then we got Esther, the Jewish girl who was elevated to queen. Okay. We have Haman, the Jew hater, and we have Mordecai, the Jew savior. Okay. So let's look at some of those, a little bit, little bit of background to, to some of those characters. Ahasuerus, the king of Persia, was that at the time? Was he the most powerful person in the world? The most powerful person in the world. In fact, history tells us that he was a very successful ruler. He gradually expanded his empire until it included 127 provinces. So this is after Babylon. Yes. This is after the time of Daniel. That's correct. And it now becomes uh, the Persian Empire. That's right. Okay. And so Ahaz, uh, how long had Ahasuerus approximately, uh, approximately been on the throne by, at this time? Well, he, uh, uh, historians tell us he reigned about 36 years. Okay. And it would probably be toward the middle of his reign at this point in the story. Okay. So it's at a time when he's presumably not conquering anymore. He's, uh, what would you call it, consolidating yeah. his, his empire? Yeah. At the first, he had a lot of uh, enemies and he had to go out and conquer those. And now he's got a, a everything under control. And it's interesting that as we open the book of Esther, we find that he's instituting two big feasts. Okay. He's calling together all of the leaders from all of the provinces, and there were so many of them that had to come to this feast that, that uh, it took 180 days to celebrate. So we're not talking about we're not talking about Jewish feasts here. We're talking about this is a, a, almost a history of the Persian Empire. This is a political feast. This is a political arrangement. People coming from all different parts of the provinces of his empire, and he's going to try and uh, show his his great majesty to them. That's correct. And the second feast? Yeah, the second feast was a more intimate feast. He had mostly the people from Shushan, who was the, that was the center of the uh, empire. That was the city at the time. The city okay. at the time, and he had all of his main officers and and the counselors come together for that feast, and it was more intimate. It was at that feast that the whole story of Esther changes because he, Vashti was the queen at that time. Okay. Vashti, by the way, means a beautiful woman. She okay. was evidently a very gorgeous woman. And he was there in all of his pomp and all of his ceremony with all of his counselors around him. And to cap off this whole big feast, he calls in Vashti. She was and, kind of the trophy bride. Yeah, that's right. He was very proud of her. But a very interesting thing happened at this point. Vashti was holding her own feast with a lot of the women of the court. And the chamberlains that Ahasuerus sent to uh, go get her, when, when they asked her to come, she absolutely refused. Really? She, yeah. turned, she turned him down? She turned him down. She and turned him, down the most powerful man of the... That's right. All of his counselors and all of his sub-rulers had come to this feast, and of all people, to turn him down... Oh, wait a second. That must have been very embarrassing for him. It's terribly embarrassing. Especially if he's trying to show how, how powerful he is with all of this... Uh, That's right. ...with all of his empire. Yeah, we, we can't hardly imagine the embarrassment that it the, must have caused. Not so much the embarrassment, probably the consequence. Yeah, right. The consequence of it was that he had to call in his chief counselor. And he said, look, we've got a problem here, a very serious problem. What are we going to do about it? Well, he had seven counselors, and the chief counselor said, well, there's only one thing you can do to save face, and that is that we've got to get rid of Vashti because she's shown this arrogance. And that arrogance could get out, and it could spread to all the rest of the empire, and pretty soon none of the women would respect their husbands. They were concerned then that the rebellion, just the small amount of rebellion that there was by her just refusing to turn up to his feast would be seen as being an instigator to further rebellion in the kingdom. That's right. That's right. Okay, so, the, so, the puni so the punishment was banish her. That's so right. now he's left without a queen? He's left without a queen. And so what happens next... Uh, the chamberlains are, give out the directive to go throughout the empire and find the most beautiful girls they could find as a replacement for Vashti. Okay, and this was where, obviously, then we get introduced to Esther. Esther. Yeah, and Mordecai did something here that was actually absolutely opposed to Jewish law. What was that? The Jews were not to marry out of their own race. Uh, we have three specific Bible references to that. Okay. Uh, the Jews were to stay within their own race. Uh, but evidently, 
In God's eyes, this was part of the divine plan, and it, Scripture gives us no reprimand to Mordecai or, or to Esther for putting Esther up as a contender for the next queen. Okay, so so now Esther, this is the this is the the background of information to get Esther into being the position of the queen. That's right. Explain the probably at this point the the other person that we need to basically understand is Mordecai. Mordecai was very instrumental in this whole story. As we mentioned before, he was Esther's foster father. He had taken very close care of her. He was very fond of her, right. and, and he was very watchful over her, a very, very good stepfather. And so he put her into contention or, or into running for to be the new, new queen. And, but he was very watchful over her. He, he made sure that she had the right care, that uh, everything was directed. So he, uh, and he was able, what, what, what position did he have? Was he able to keep an eye over her in the, in the court or in the palace? He had been elevated at that point in time to keep her the gate. He was uh, really one of the bodyguards. He watched what was going on in the city gate. So if, in the city, so, so uh, the people who handled the security, he was over the security for That's the correct. city. That's correct. So anyone who comes in and goes out, he yeah, knew he, about, he, he was knew, aware knew about what was he going was on. He was aware of it. And as we'll see later in the story, this was absolutely essential in God's div divine plan. Again, placing somebody in the right place at right the right time. Right place at the right time. Now, how does, he, how does he keep in touch with Esther once she's into the court of the women or the house of the women? There was a man by the name of Haggai who was a keeper of the women. He was a chamberlain who was in touch with Mordecai, and so but they, they had a channel of information between the two of them. That's how Esther kept in touch with the outside world, and that's how Mordecai kept in touch with Esther. Okay, now I know from the, the, the background to the story that we really you know, want to focus in on, there's a little bit of a story where that channel of communication, right people in the right place at the right time, helps save Ahasuerus' life. Right, there was a conspiracy hatched between two of Ahasuerus' closest bodyguards. And they were the ones assigned to take care of him during the night and they would have had easy access to him and they conspired to assassinate him. It would have been a very easy and quick uh, assassination, right, wouldn't right. it? And somehow Mordecai gets wind of this, and secretly he passes the word up to Esther, who gives it to uh, Ahasuerus. Ahasuerus calls an inquiry, and it's found out that it's true, that these two had conspired to kill him, and so they're immediately hung. But for some reason, and this is an interesting part of the story, no big thing is made of what Mordecai has done here. It's written down in the record book, but he's not commended for it. He's not given any reward of any kind for saving the king's life, but that's providential. That comes up later okay. in the story. Okay, and I was just going to say this is so true. Sometimes we want, to have, we want to have the accolade. We want to have the glory now. And you're saying that at that time, Mordecai wasn't, uh, wasn't given any reward, wasn't given any thanks it's almost as if, in a way, now he's, he, Ahasuerus owes him one. He, he owes sure him a does. favor. He sure does. And, and uh, this, this comes up a little bit later. And also, yeah. and also to Esther as well. Presumably he knows now that Esther has helped save his life and Mordecai has, no, has saved his life. But not, so nothing's done nothing's at this done. particular time. So that's the background to it. That's right. Now, I know that there's a process of time. You know, what, what sort of time are we talking about? About five years goes uh, by. Okay, so yeah. about five years goes by. Yeah. Just business as usual sort of thing That's with right. uh, Mordecai in, t in charge of the security right. of the gate, right. Esther in the court of the women, right. Ahasuerus on the throne. Then there's a man came, uh, named Haman who comes into the picture. Right, okay. And he is elevated to second in command under Ahasuerus. And he gets all caught up in the pomp and ceremony of his position. So he's sort of elevated in the court. He finds the king's good graces. Yes, he is. He's not like a strong man. Uh, he actually becomes a little bit more than that. He becomes more like a god to the people because he wanted them to bow down to him every time he came through the court. Okay, so he, was, he has this arrogance. He has oh, he's this, very, very arrogant. He, he liked, very so arrogant. He, he wanted to be then uh, lauded or gloried over as, as, a, as a god then. That's right. He so every time to. he walked by, everybody bow. was to bow the knee to him. Right. Now, Mordecai, following the Jewish tradition that there is only one person to bow to, and that's the God of heaven, refuses to bow to him. But that's not noticed by Haman right away. Haman is so caught up in his pride and his arrogance that he evidently was walking right by Mordecai and didn't even see that he wasn't bowing to him. But there was a couple of uh, servants of Haman that noticed it. So Mordecai is doing it quietly, not drawing attention to the fact that he's not bowing the knee to Haman. That's correct. 
Um, so uh, Mordecai, let me just pause on that. For, Mordecai's principle for not bowing the knee presumably comes up in discussion then with people who must have turned around and said, hey, what are you doing? Why aren't you bowing the knee to, to, to Haman? What well, was he, his made, he made it very clear to, to uh, Ahasuerus' servants that he was a Jew and that the only person that he honored in his life that he would bow to was the God of Israel. And so when they saw him not bowing to Haman, it, it really bothered them. They said, if we have to bow to Haman, why doesn't this Jew have to bow to Haman? So they were, again, concerned about this sign of rebellion. Right. Not right. somebody not doing what they thought that they should be doing. Right. Now, did they know? So did they know at that time that Mordecai was a Jew? He obviously yes, he, he told them he, he told he, them he told them he was a Jew. Yeah. But but he had told Esther to keep it quiet. Yes. So she, so yeah. no one knows that Esther is 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 Jewish. Not at this point. And now Mordecai is Jewish. Now, what was the problem then that Haman had? So every time now he walks by, he's looking specifically for That's Mordecai right. to see if he's if he's bowing. Right. And Haman or Mordecai refused to bow the knee to him. And so this angered uh, Haman. But it's interesting that the story tells us, as you've read there, that he restrained himself. A lot of men that get angry, you know, they just fly off the handle real quick. Right. But Haman restrained himself. And here we see another sign of God's providence, his design. Now, he was holding his temper. Why would it have been, why would it have been so, uh, so potentially dangerous that Haman be, be angered by a Jew? Well, he could kill him right now. I mean, you know, he could ask for his death right on the spot. But that wasn't part of God's design. It wasn't to be. You know, it wasn't to be. Was it relevant that, that Haman was from a different uh, part of the empire? He was a, what was he? A, a, he was an, an Agagite. An, Agag an Agagite. An Agagite. Okay. And, and there was a hostility that went clear back in the history of the Jews, the Agagites. This, they were from the, from the tribe of Amalek. Okay, I've and, heard of that name before. Yeah, Amalek was one of the first tribes that refused Israel passage when they were journeying to the land. Oh, so, so when, when, when the children of Israel left uh, Egypt, yeah. they went through the, the sea, they're walking in the wilderness, they, they refused them right. passage. Yeah. And Joshua, uh, you know, this, this whole thing started back with Joshua and God said to go in and wipe out the land, kill every man, woman, and child. And it finally ends with Mordecai in the, in the temple, in the Persian temple. Okay, so you have, you have then the Amalekites who have been the historical enemies of the children of Israel, now personified, if you like, by Haman. That's correct. And you have the, the, uh, uh, the Jewish people, the children of Israel, personified by Mordecai. Yeah, it's a parable. It's almost, yeah, it's a parable. It's almost that's like right. a face-off yeah. now between, right. between these two, two foes. Yeah, that's true. And, and trouble is brewing because now Mordecai is not bending the knee to, to the, the, right. to the, uh, the yeah. person, the yeah. arrogant that's Haman. Right. And he's got this anger seething within him, but he's restraining it at this point. Okay. Now, what um, what's the next step of the of the of the story? How does how does it how does it get worse? Well, it gets worse in that fact that uh, Vashti is now deposed as a queen. Esther, you know, is elevated as queen. And then, this is an amazing uh, set of sequence of, of incidents. On a certain night, Ahasuerus cannot get to sleep. He's tossing in his sleep. He's king, emperor of 127 provinces, but he can't, he's not king of 10 minutes sleep. Mm -hmm. And so what does he do? Here is an amazing part of God's plan. He's laying awake at night. Should he call for his musicians? Should he call for a poet to read to him? Should he call for dancing girls? What should he do? Of all things, he calls for a book to be read. Not, not a song book, not a poetry book, a book of the history of the empire. So he's trying to get to sleep, is what you're saying. He's trying to get to sleep, Because <laughs> yeah. that would be very boring reading, wouldn't right, you think? Right, right. But he happens on a certain place in the book, and this is all God-directed, and he reads about Mordecai saving his life. It's all recorded in the book of Shushan. Of all of the provinces that he could have pulled a book off the shelf from, he, he pulls the book of Shushan the palace. Now, what are the odds of that happening? That's got to be the, yeah. the direction of God. And so during the reading of this book, 
the recorder tells him about Mordecai saving his life. And immediately he says, well, has anything been done? To okay, so now, now is the time when he comes and says, yeah. oh, has he been rewarded? Yeah, has he been Thanked. rewarded? Yeah. yeah, no, and, and the recorder says, no, not a thing has been done for him. And so what does Ahasuerus do at that point? Oh, he, he acts in haste, and he, he was sleepy. Now he's wide awake. He says, well, we've got to do something for this man. He saved my life. And what was, a, what was arranged? What was arranged at that point is that he calls for uh, Mordecai to see if, you know, he can be found. Obviously, uh, uh, he was, I don't know where he was at that point in time, but he asked, uh, who is in the court? You know, he wants to go, go do something for Mordecai, and he wants to do it right now. And, so, and of all things, Haman is in the court. He had come real early in the morning to ask for Mordecai's death. Oh, he had? Yeah. So he was so, he was so angered by Mordecai uh, failing to bow the knee to him, to honor him, right. that he's actually just come to see the king to ask for Mordecai's death. Yeah, this and came about, uh, Esther had asked Ahasuerus and Haman to come to a feast, and Haman was all elevated, you know, that the queen had called him in, and he starts out into the court once again, and here's Mordecai, he wouldn't bow the knee to him, and all of a sudden his anger just flares. Okay, and so, so Ahasuerus is saying, who's in the court because I want to make sure that something is done right for Mordecai to thank him for what he did five right. years ago. Yeah. And Haman's the one standing there. Yeah, of all things. And so what was, and Ahasuerus uh, says, uh, a, give him a, a, Yeah, he says, and I want you to take this man through the city and show him all the pomp and ceremony. Worship, so, so Haman now has to worship Mordecai. Yeah, and you can imagine how dejected Haman must have been. And Humiliating he, for him. Yeah, yeah, he knew that, uh, he knew something was, uh, he, he knew something was going to happen to him at that point. So this is the personal, this is the personal battle between, not battle, but the personal problem between uh, uh, Haman and Mordecai. Right. And yet at the same time, Haman personifies a greater enemy to, right. to, to, and a greater threat. I mean, now we know that there's the story of Esther is really filled with this threat that there was to the Jewish people. Mm -hmm. um, and so you have now not only Haman representing the Amalekites, but Mordecai representing the, 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 Jewish, the Jewish people. people. That's correct. And now you've got it boy coming to a head. That's right. So it's the right people in the right place at the right time. Right. It's always it's that what it comes down to. And again, that's God's design. And so going back to really the introductory you know, comment that we started off with, this book of Esther contains examples of people who uh, uh, succumb to weakness and temptation. And that was Haman. Haman, right. Haman succumbed to the weakness of the, of the flesh to say, hey, I want to be gloried. I want the glory now. I proud, want you to very proud man. Very proud. I want you to bow down to me. Right. Of course, there's a very human instinct, obviously. Yeah. Um, and yet you have, at the same time, uh, comparison with Mordecai, who does the right thing, saves somebody's life, doesn't take any credit for it then. Very patient man. Very patient. Yeah. And so this is the man, this is the example of the person who, the things that are approved of by God, That's right. whereas Haman personifies the right. person who's not approved of by very God. Very relevant story, although right. it happened so many years ago that we can relate to today. Ron, thank you very much for bringing this to our attention, for, for coming and sharing that with us. Okay. And uh, we'll, be, we'll be right back in just a minute to wrap this up. Uh, stay tuned while we have a, a free literature offer uh, that accompanies this program. For pamphlets and articles on this subject and other Bible subjects, Go to www.thisisyourbible.com, click on the Library tab, and select from Basic Bible Teaching, Bible Study, Doctrine, Life, Prophecy, The Christadelphians. In addition to our library, thisisyourbible.com offers online Bible study courses and Bible answers to your questions. Select www.thisisyourbible.com to increase your understanding of God's Word and learn about His future kingdom on the earth. So take a look at the book of Esther. Take a look at this lesson, this comparison that is in there between the things that God approves of and the things He doesn't approve of. The attitude of Haman versus the attitude of Mordecai. Of course, there's a much bigger lesson in there as well. But the lesson for us is really, are we of Mordecai or are we of Haman? Uh, the New Testament, they ask this question, are you of the world or are you Christ's? Join us again for another episode of This Is Your Bible and we'll continue this discussion. Mm -hmm.